reuse materials and some that you're very familiar with uh, for engineering biomedical implants. So the first thing that I like to start with is really defining what a biomaterial is. So we all know what a material is <laughs> and the material materials are all around us. Uh, you know, we are, uh, you know, part materials. We're made up of different materials. Um, but in our field of, in my field of biomedical engineering, we consider a biomaterial to be any substance that uh, is engineered to interact with a biological system for a medical purpose. So, um, you know, so if we just strictly uh, thought about, uh, you know, the non-medical purposes, then, you know, things like clothing that we see here, technically that does interact with a biological system, which is you because it contacts your skin. Um, you may also uh, know, some of you may have allergies or may know of someone who has allergies to certain fabrics. Um, and, and that is also a kind of biomaterial response. But uh, for the most part, uh, we consider um, the biomaterials for applications um, in medicine, like implanting something to get a total knee replacement when someone uh, you know, has osteoarthritis or has very poor function of their bones. Um, it can even be considered, um, as some biomaterials don't really have to be implanted into your body. So, you know, materials like the polymer in your, you know, hydrogel soft contact lens or hard contact lenses, that's also a type of biomaterial because it's interacting with um, the biological system of the eye. And uh, so uh, biomaterials kind of have a broad definition. So, you know, I mentioned specifically that my group and a lot of the, um, the researchers here in the department in biomaterials are concerned with creating uh, new implants. Uh, so an implant defined is a thing or you know, a material, like we talked about, a biomaterial that's implanted in something else. Um, so placed within the body or um, you know, partially in the body or on top of the body. So, uh, um, so that can encompass a, a number of different things. It's fairly obvious that something like this uh, fracture fixation plate with screws would be, um, that would have to be um, inside the body to, um, to make the, the bones go together so that they heal better. But there can also be systems that, um, you know, they might have the plate on uh, the bone, but there may be screws and pieces that are sticking out of the skin. So not all of that material has to be um, implanted within the body. And there are some like these uh, dental implants that um, might be partially um, within the bone and the tissue, but the other part may be um, outside. Um, and that might interact with the environment. And that um, can lead to some issues that I'll cover a little bit later more on my specific research topic. So, um, so in biomaterials and with any kind of material, uh, you know, materials engineering, there are really three general classifications that most of our materials fall into, well, you know, technically there's a fourth, but that's, uh, you know, we'll talk about that. So the first is polymers, and these are things like plastics, um, you know, that make up your milk cartons, probably your keyboard that you are uh, typing on, 
um, you know, things that we are very commonly familiar with and we think of as plastics. So those are types of polymers. Most of these shown here are synthetic polymers, uh, but we actually, um, a, a lot of our tissues and a lot of our body uh, you know, is composed of biopolymers. So biopolymers can be synthetic plastics or they can be proteins and things that, that we make. And, you know, obviously, as shown here, a lot of implant materials that you may be familiar with, like the um, you know, total knee replacements, total hip replacements, those need to be pretty strong. Uh, so uh, sometimes we use different types of metals. So, you know, metals is another general category. Um, the other category is ceramics. And so an example of ceramics and some other um, materials and building materials would be things like stone and brick and, um, and uh, marble. So, you know, again, those things are very, very strong and they have a lot of good properties um, and a lot of resistance to degradation. So um, the fourth uh, category that is kind of a, um, that's what we know of as composites. So it's also possible to make a material that has a little bit of ceramic component within a polymer or a little bit of a metal component within a ceramic. And so that's what's known as a composite. So, um, you know, here's where I'm gonna, you know, ask you guys to uh, be a little bit interactive. So, um, so in the chat box, if you could think of some advantages of ceramics and biomaterials and maybe some disadvantages also. So to stimulate uh, some of the discussion, I've uh, included some images of both um, here on the left, some implants that are made of ceramics. So these are calcium sulfate bone graft substitute uh, pellets. Um, and this is a hip, um, a hip socket replacement from a, a total hip replacement. Um, but then also as an example of um, a different type of ceramic, I've included a picture of these um, glasses. So um, the glasses that you drink from. So, um, so um, go ahead and if you can think of some things, uh, could you uh, type in the chat what comes to your mind first about what would be good about using a ceramic as a biomaterial? You know, someone typed in, they are strong. So, you know, they can support um, something like this alumina. Um, uh, you know, this I th think is alumina, you know, things like the marble and stone that uh, houses are built from. They're very, very mechanically strong. Also, um, you know, compared to metals, uh, you know, someone mentioned that they don't corrode, so they're not going to rust over time. And um, they also, you can have um, have them uh, degrade or not degrade. Um, so these calcium sulfate pellets here, they will eventually get resorbed by the body, which is good because you don't have to have a second surgery to go in and remove them. Um, but um, they degrade over a certain amount of time. Something like this, um, this alumina ceramic, it's very, uh, very um, resistant to degradation. So, you know, this thing is not going to, um, it's not going to just dissolve in the body. Um, so, you know, um, yes, the availability, you know, they're um, relatively inexpensive, especially compared to some metals. You know, it's a, a lot uh, cheaper to come by um, 
some of these ceramics. Um, there are maybe some processing, you know, when you get into the um, biomaterials arena, because, you know, they need to be very pure and medical grade. Um, as far as lightweight, you know, it's kind of, um, it, it kind of depends on the type, but it would be kind of similar to metal compared to some other materials though, they may be a little bit on the heavier side. So, um, so yeah, they, um, so somebody, um, you know, has also said that, you know, they might not uh, chip as much, um, you know, so, um, you know, that's part of being strong, um, particularly with the crystalline aspects. Um, they are also, yes, definitely able to withstand high heat and pressure. Um, so, you know, your coffee mug that you have, um, you know, you can uh, pour hot coffee into it and it's not just going to melt. You can uh, take uh, some ceramic bakeware and bake it in the oven and nothing's going to happen to it. So that is a, a huge advantage when it comes to um, some applications. So um, now we've covered a lot of the advantages. What is a major potential disadvantage. So when you think about uh, what ha would happen if I took th those glasses and got mad and threw it against the wall, what would happen? So, you know, while everybody else, uh, you know, maybe type some disadvantages in, one of the, the big things that, you know, could be a limitation in using ceramics is that they will break. And so they're brittle. So they can withstand a lot of pressure, but once they do um, you know, have enough, enough stresses or sudden stresses, like you know, if um, there's a sudden impact, then it could just break into uh, little pieces. And so you know, like uh, Pragna pointed out in the chat, um, you know, if that happens with an implant like this, then you're stuck with hundreds um, or, you know, maybe, you know, a lot of sharp shards that could uh, definitely cause some pain and, um, you know, it could, um, it could limit the application um, and, you know, you would need to you know, be very careful with who you would implant something like this in. Um, you know, as far as these calcium sulfate uh, devices, they are um, they are degradable. You know, they're not uh, as they degrade, they're not going to have as much structural support that uh, that some of the other ceramics or other materials might be able to offer. So those are some high points and, and low points, uh, advantages and disadvantages of ceramics. Not to say that uh, ceramics are not good for certain applications and they definitely have a lot of uses in, um, in the body, um, particularly because you know, some parts of your body are a majority ceramic. So uh, does anybody know what, uh, what part of your body, what uh, type of organ or system would be um, kind of hard like a, a rock or a mineral um, and able to support um, a lot of stress and weight and day-to-day -day activity, but can also break? <laughs> And fracture. Yes, so uh, bones. So bones are, you know, they're actually a composite, but they have a lot of components that are um, mineral or ceramic. So that's what gives them their strength and, you know, why they don't just dissolve away, um, you know, but again, 
you know, they're very strong, they can support our weight and our activities, but then uh, they have the potential to fracture. So um, let's see here. So now we'll talk about metals. So, um, so you know, here's a, a picture of metal bar stock that might be machined or shaped into something like an implant um, that uh, would fix your bones together, fracture fixation. So, you know, and here's a, a display of different types of metals. Um, so, uh, so some advantages of metals. Uh, so, um, so someone has put in a disadvantage. So a lot of these metals um, like cobalt, um, gold, silver, and, and some of these when they're um, when they're placed within the body and those metal ions are released, then the body can consider them to be toxic. And so you can get metal poisoning. Somebody also pointed out that yes, metals are expensive. We, um, you know, we have a, a lot of implants that, uh, you know, so titanium is a, a great material because it's very lightweight. Um, it's good to use for bone implants. Um, it's strong um, and, um, you know, it's good, but uh, it's very, very expensive. Um, also, you know, platinum is a, is a fairly compatible metal with the body and it's used a lot in things like stimulation electrodes because it's, um, you know, one of the advantages is that it's electrically conductive. So, you know, if you need something that's gonna deliver an electrical current, then metals are excellent for that. But uh, platinum is pretty expensive. So that is a, a disadvantage from a material standpoint. Um, somebody mentioned a definite disadvantage is that they can corrode. So, you know, I mean, it may be fine to have, um, you know, your mailbox rust after a, a few years in the rain because, you know, it's not really going to hurt very much. But if you have a, a knee implant that starts to rust and to release uh, iron particles into your body, then that uh, can be, um, that can, can lead to a very bad situation in the body. Um, it's also, um, so somebody pointed out that it is very strong. So, um, you know, it tends to have um, a, around the same strength, um, probably a little bit more than the bones. So you don't want some of these implants to be too strong or, you know, too, um, too strong when compared to the bone that they're intended to help function. Um, uh, they also, yes, they are good conductors of heat and they're good conductors of electricity. So if that is um, part of what you need in your application as a biomaterial, then metals are a good choice. So there's also a lot of um, and there's a, a lot of different um, ways that you can um, form them and fabricate them. So, uh, you know, it's uh, sometimes easy to, uh, to pull these apart to form uh, long rods if you need them or to melt them and to form them into uh, particular shapes. It's pretty easy to polish them um, and to get a, a nice surface finish. So uh, they're very easy to work with under the right conditions too. So that's part of that. You know, they're good conductors of heat. They also um, can be, you know, at, at very high heat, they are um, relatively malleable. Uh, you're able to form them into different shapes. Uh, such as those complicated shapes that you would need for implants. 
Um, so polymers and plastics we'll talk about next. So, um, so some of these uh, devices that I'm showing here, um, so one of them is not really a medical device, but um, the same material that makes this polyethylene. Um, so this is showing a polyethylene shopping bag. Um, the same material processed a little bit differently is the same thing that you would find in something like this uh, uh, tibial component for a total knee replacement. So um, these, uh, so this is a, a hydrogel, probably a type of polyhema um, polymer that makes up uh, something like this soft contact lens. So, um, so this is a, a hydrogel. It gives it its properties of being flexible. Um, these um, implants right here that are shown are types of uh, joint replacements for the fingers. So, you know, they can be used to replace some of those, um, some of the finger joints and other applications, toe joints. Um, so um, probably some of these images will show uh, some of the advantages and disadvantages of polymers and plastics, um, but maybe uh, what compared to some of the previous materials that we talked about would be um, advantages of polymers. Yes, so you know they are um, probably um, not as resistant as metals and ceramics to uh, stresses. Um, you know, and an advantage or a disadvantage, depending on what you um, are thinking about, is that they are um, sometimes way too long lasting. So, you know, that's great if you plan to have your implant for a long time, but it also can lead to issues um, like, uh, you know, how, how do you recycle them or, you know, how many plastics are remaining um, you know, in the environment, uh, you know, so we can recycle some of these plastics, but they're, um, you know, they are um, a little bit, uh, you know, sometimes it can be a problem that they don't go away quickly enough. So, you know, somebody uh, pointed out that they, um, you know, in comparison to metals and ceramics, uh, you know, most of these are not very strong. So, you know, they're not going to be able to withstand a lot of force, um, you know, probably enough in this case for the knee implant uh, to, uh, you know, to uh, sustain, um, you know, walking and normal daily activities. But as somebody said, uh, you know, over time, when that metal component rubs against this, uh, you know, so flakes of this or particles are gonna chip off. Um, yes, yeah, so Sachin, I'm not sure if I'm saying that right, uh, has pointed out that they're flexible. So that's a great uh, thing for um, a, a particular application like these finger joints because you need them to be uh, bendable, um, you know, these contact lenses, um, you know, it's kind of an advantage that they can, you know, mold to your eye and they can, you know, somewhat adapt to the shape and they're um, soft. So contact lenses don't have to be soft. Um, there are hard contact lenses. I'm not sure how popular they are um, recently, but I know my sister had hard contact lenses and you know, had a, a very difficult time adjusting to them because, um, I mean, for something like that, uh, you know, then, you know, a soft material may be, a, may be more appropriate. So um, some advantages also are that they're very ductile. So that means that you can pull them apart and stretch them and they can, uh, you know, they can bend, um, you know, they have a lot of elastic properties. So, you know, that can be advantageous for certain um, applications. 
I mean, you can think about applications where stretching would be good for fabrics like clothes, which a lot of our clothes are made from uh, polymers. Um, so uh, yes, so Shachi um, has said that they're easy to modify. So, you know, it's very easy to process these into different shades, especially some of some of the polymers that all we need to do to form them into these specialized shapes is just to melt them, pour them into a mold, um, you know, and then we can also, we can apply certain treatments like uh, heat treatments or uh, crosslinkers or uh, UV light to um, get them to, um, to either have improved strength or to uh, present a different surface in the body. Um, and I'll also point out that uh, a lot of these types of materials also show up in nature. So, um, you know, I, um, so, uh, you know, among all of these uh, different materials, um, all of these have um, perhaps some elements of ceramics, metals, and polymers. So, um, you know, this um, is a, a gypsum mine. So, uh, so this is a source of natural ceramics. Um, the spider web, does anybody um, have a, a guess on what type of material that is? If it's polymer, ceramic, or metal. So it is a uh, pretty stretchy and pretty, um, you know, so yes, it is a polymer. So people have started to guess. So, uh, so uh, spider silk is a type of polymer. And, and we know from, uh, you know, from, uh, you know, hopefully not very often interacting with these spider webs because they can kind of get annoying that you know, these polymers are very lightweight, um, they're strong. Uh, so, you know, I, I think that silk is something that has, you know, the highest strength to, to weight ratio among the national, uh, natural polymers. So, uh, you know, so my lab works a lot with a biomaterial called chitosan, which is another type of polymer. And it's derived from chitin, which is a type of polymer that's in these shrimp shells and also things like mushrooms. So everything from the keratin in your hair to uh, the collagen in your skin, um, those are some naturally derived biomaterials. Um, and so, you know, so when we talk about the advantages of using natural materials versus something like what we would make the plastic bag from, there are a lot of different, uh, you know, advantages. And so somebody, you know, is typing uh, in that, um, that they can decompose. And so that is exactly one of the major benefits is that a lot of these uh, natural materials, they weren't meant to be around for a long time. So um, they can also uh, degrade, um, degrade within the body at a rate that is um, sustainable. Um, so, uh, you know, also somebody was talking about uh, the source of them. So, you know, it, um, it is really a renewable resource because, you know, we can, uh, you know, we can, uh, you know, get shrimp or um, mushrooms or other sources, or, um, you know, there's some biomaterials that even may be made from spider silk or other types of polymers like collagen. And so, you know, we kind of have a, a renewable supply of those. Um, and, um, like Sachin said, they have natural compounds in them. So the way that our body reacts to those or how it sees them and you know, how proteins uh, react with them 
it's going to be a little bit more friendly than something like, uh, you know, a, the material in a plastic bag. So, you know, those are some advantages. Um, you know, so here I'm showing a picture here of an electrospun chitosan membrane. And so, you know, we can fabricate it into forms that are very closely mimicking whatever tissue they're meant to, um, to replace. Um, and, um, you know, you, we can make things like naturally resorbable um, sutures. I think that this image is showing um, a, a 3D printed um, vascular graph. So something that's meant to replace a blood vessel that's made from all, uh, all natural materials. So, um, so, you know, one thing that Pragna has brought up is that, uh, so when this stuff degrades, and yes, it's supposed to degrade, you know, it, it's not really like um, corrosion, like metal, but if this breaks into different pieces, then our body can handle that a little bit better than uh, something like a, a medical part, a, a, a metal particle uh, that has um, flaked off from rust. So there are a lot of advantages of using natural materials and a lot of um, my more recent research has focused on using some of these natural materials, particularly that uh, material chitosan that's derived from shrimp shells and mushrooms. So um, I'm going to ask some questions. Um, so if you guys were uh, biomedical engineers and you were trying to uh, engineer a soft tissue, like something um, in the lips or maybe um, you know, a muscle loss or you know, somebody's lost uh, some soft tissue, so, um, so yeah, we've got a lot of votes for polymers and also natural materials. So, you know, and, and you know, I kind of uh, put uh, this as an example for a reason because, you know, a lot of you may be familiar with some celebrities or some other, um, uh, some other types of modifications and implants that, um, people can uh, have for aesthetic reasons. And a lot of the um, materials that are used for things like uh, soft tissue, like lip injections or um, other types of facial fillers are polymer based. Um, and they're also natural polymers. So you guys have, have guessed pretty well there. Um, but, you know, who's to say, uh, you know, I mean, it's probably possible that you could have a metal or a, um, a ceramic implant for that. But for the most part, like for a tissue like that, you don't need something as strong or as toxic as metals. Uh, you know, you don't need something that is very hard like ceramic. So polymers would probably win in this one. So, uh, so as far as if we were trying to engineer something to replace a segment of bone, like let's say uh, we have, um, we've, you know, we've got someone who's broken their bone really, really badly, and there are lots of pieces that have come out. So uh, yes, a, a pretty good choice might be ceramic. So, um, so what I've shown uh, some here is, uh, you know, so there's a, a lot of tissue engineering approaches that might use multiple different types of materials, but uh, ceramic would be very advantageous uh, for bone because it's strong. 
Um, it also can promote uh, bone healing. So um, there are lots of different types of calcium phosphates and calcium sulfates and calcium-based materials that the bone almost recognizes as you know, very similar to, um, to that. Um, so, uh, so a, another thing though that that might be strong to uh, you know help to help to get the bone to heal naturally, you could have a, a metal implant there. So the disadvantage of a metal implant in that context would be that um, you know if you put a block of metal here, then it's not going anywhere. So, you know, eventually either you would have to keep this as part of your body for a long, long time, you know, until that piece of metal, you know, rusts or breaks or whatever, um, or um, you, you would have to have it removed at some point. So, you know, polymers, could also be useful in this. And, you know, actually the approach that's used a lot of times is more of a composite approach. So, you know, you could have a material that's part polymer, part ceramic, and maybe even part metal to kind of blend together all of the advantages of those. So that's a lot of what we do um, as biomedical engineers is try to make decisions on what types of materials to use for these applications. Um, so, you know, technically it could be one of all three or, you know, a combination of all of them. Um, so now I'm just kind of, kind of wrap up by talking about the focus of my research. So, I focus on ways that we can keep these implants and these materials from causing infection or from getting contaminated and specifically how to keep bacteria like this Staph aureus or this Pseudomonas or E. coli from forming what's known as a biofilm. And that's when uh, the bacteria sticks to a surface and it's very, very difficult to remove it once it's stuck to it. So, this is a, a broad problem and it has multiple different uh, impacts on society and particularly in medicine. So, um, you know, we've had some people mention that, you know, maybe they've had implants and um, they've had, um, you know, things like hip replacements or, um, you know, maybe you've had um, broken bones that you've had to, you know, have, um, had uh, biomaterials to set. Um, so definitely um, our uh, military members and veterans uh, have injuries that, that need to be treated. And you know, really it is a, it's a huge responsibility and uh, a huge uh, burden to the healthcare system to manage infections. Um, so infection could occur from um, multiple different sources. So um, you could have a, an injury that gets contaminated um, in the hospital. Um, you might have um, you know, something like this uh, soldier in combat. So if you get an injury out in the field um, like that, then you know, it's very likely that you're going to have debris and dirt that uh, could contaminate and that could uh, contain bacteria and maybe more bacteria than your body can handle or get rid of. Um, so um, we try to think of ways that we can prevent that and uh, keep that from happening or to treat it if it does happen. And so, you know, a lot of you guys are probably very, very familiar with uh, one of the, the first approaches, which is prevention. And so, um, you know, and I will have the disclaimer that I don't personally have anything, um, I don't have any projects that study COVID-19 or coronavirus, but we're all kind of now familiar with these types of uh, PPE setups, uh, things designed to protect patients from um, 
from getting contaminated and also to protect the, the medical staff. So you know, that is one line of defense. Another line of defense for, um, for both bacteria and viruses is antibiotics, but we're kind of running out of options with antibiotics and uh, you know, the progress on new antibiotics is pretty slow. Um, so some of my work is more um, related to this type of scenario where we want to make those surfaces unfriendly for bacteria. So, you know, to promote either the bacteria not adhering to the surface or surfaces that might be able to kill the bacteria and keep it from attaching. Um, so, um, you know, this is a, a little bit technical, but I specifically work also with drug delivery. So two molecules that we um, can deliver to try to break up this biofilm. So in this image, uh, these purple dots are meant to uh, represent a biofilm on a material like an orthopedic implant. And so we can um, deliver things like local anesthetics like bupivacaine um, or cis-2 decanoic acid, which is a, a simple fatty acid to try to get those uh, bacteria. So first they have effects in killing bacteria, but also um, you know, they can stimulate that bacteria to remove from the surface and to detach from the surface. So, you know, and, you know, this uh, concept of biofilm where bacteria attach to surfaces, um, attaches to surfaces, that can have a lot of different impacts. I specifically uh, tend to focus more on things like orthopedic implants, things like total hip replacements or these fracture fixation devices, but, um, one figure that I've come across is that um, biofilm may be responsible for up to 80% of all of the bacterial infections that are possible. So, you know, this could be, you know, things like, uh, you know, you get an eye infection from your contact lenses that could be due to uh, biofilm. Um, you know, definitely uh, you know, the orthopedic implants, when they become contaminated, it can be a, a big problem. A lot of the non-material related infections are actually also due to biofilm where bacteria attaches. So, you know, things that, that you may have experienced before, like, uh, like ear infections or sinusitis um, or um, urinary tract infections and kidney stones. So you know, there's a lot of um, healthcare impact of these types of infections. So we're working really hard to try to, to minimize that impact for patients. So you know, I'll also show you a little bit about you know, how we make the biomaterial. So we uh, fabricate a lot of these things on the bench top. And so, you know, we, um, uh, we use our scales, mixers, beakers, um, all the, the nice sciencey stuff. Uh, we can use uh, syringes sometimes to mix our gel-like materials. We also use electro spinning, which is a special, it's a special way of making a fiber mat where a charged solution like that natural polymer is ejected from an, a needle and in an electric field, it will um, make these small, small fibers. Um, and so, you know, we also do a lot of testing of our biomaterials. So if we're trying to test whether or not our materials can resist bacteria, then we can do a lot of simple assays where we um, either put the material in direct contact with bacteria and then we count how many there are that um, 
either come off or um, are still viable. We can also stain the bacteria um, on whether or not it's alive or dead. So this is showing um, a specific type of sensor material um, in a control form and then one that's been coated with an antimicrobial. And so everywhere that this shows up as green is supposed to be a live bacterium. So you can see that one of these, the control, has lots and lots of live bacteria, whereas we can only see you know, a few maybe little specks of green um, for the one that's loaded with an antimicrobial coating. And so you've probably uh, seen you know, some of these tests like this zone of inhibition or Kirby-Bauer assay where you put um, a material that's supposed to be releasing an antibiotic on um, a lawn of bacteria. And um, you know, if you look for this little zone of clearing, um, so the bacteria does not like that, uh, that antibiotic that's being released. So it's not gonna grow um, within a certain zone around that, um, that antimicrobial. So we do a lot of lab work on the bench. Um, so you know, this is showing some of the, the tools that we use like pipetters. Um, you know, so we can load these materials with various drugs and um, measure how much, um, how much of these therapeutics come off over time. So this is showing a graph of how some of our materials release uh, a drug called bupivacaine. Um, we also use specialized instrumentation to uh, determine how much concentration of uh, particular antibiotics. So this is kind of showing the setup of an HPLC system. So you know, this is an instrument that we have in our lab. And this is kind of a schematic of how a sample is injected into um, the pump and that goes into the column. And, um, and then we can use the area under the curve here for these peaks that show up in the detector to uh, calculate something like how much of the drug vancomycin is in this solution or how much um, vancomycin is in this particular blood sample or plasma sample. So you know, we use a lot of advanced instrumentation um, we also use uh, in vitro evaluation. So these are some examples of times where we've taken our biomaterials like these um, biopolymer chitosan beads and we'll put them in contact with cells that uh, are derived from skin or other tissues in the body and try to determine whether or not that material or whatever's being released from it is killing the cells or has any kind of toxic effects. So you know, this is just um, you know, some images of some of the things that we do in the lab. So you know, we work with um, microbiology type research. So you know, there's a lot of um, doing things in the biosafety cabinet, um, you know, plating bacteria samples you know, measuring things out, you know, in the lab, making up solutions. It's almost like uh, cooking. You know, if any of you enjoy cooking, um, you know, a lot of the mixing up of solutions and um, making of the materials is, um, you know, we like to follow recipes. Um, and, you know, one part of my research and, you know, what the students, um, really grow a lot at is, you know, not just doing the lab work, but we also have students that go and present their research at conferences um, around the world. And so, you know, here um, are two of my graduate students. One has graduated recently and one um, is staying for a PhD. And you know, here they are, you know, presenting and answering questions on a panel at a, a national meeting for the musculoskeletal infection society. So, 
somehow uh, skipped through a bunch of stuff. Let me go back there. So um, you know, I'm not going to get too much into this, and I will, you know, again, have the disclaimer that I don't really, um, you know, have any projects to 3D print a new heart. But, um, you know, I am a member of a consortium and there's a, a large group of investigators in the Memphis area that are specifically trying to focus on um, 3D printing and uh, tissue regeneration, um, tissue engineering applications so that one day, you know, instead of having to have organ donors, um, you can um, print to order you know, a specific organ to replace um, a, a damaged organ or um, one with, with limited function. So those are kind of some of the cool things that are up and coming, but we're not quite there yet. I'd like to thank um, my funding sources, especially the National Science Foundation also have funding from the Department of Defense and the NIH, and also um, locally, the FedEx Institute of Technology funded a, a lot of development work that went into getting these larger grants. So I'd also like to thank all of the members of my research team and my collaborators and the students, um, especially. So, um, and also, thank you. So, um, you know, we have some time if anybody has particular questions. Um, you know, if you want to turn the screen on, I'm not sure if Dr. Ivy has it where you can um, unmute yourselves. Yeah, they should be able to unmute if they would like to ask questions and they're welcome to turn their videos on if they would like. Um, <clears throat> if you don't have, um, a mic on your computer, you can also just type a question into the chat as well. I want to say hi. I'm Alexis Jones's mom. I know she helped you a lot. <laughs> Faraday, hopefully she'll be coming soon. I know she's helping, working with uh, Dr. Ivy now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. So Alexis is one of our undergraduate students that has helped with some of this research. Any questions from anyone? All right. Well, if you think of something afterwards, oh, there we go. There's one. Okay. So, um, you know, this one is talking about developing better prosthetics. So prosthetics could be something that are completely within uh, the body. So uh, we consider things like um, hip replacements and knee replacements, periprosthetics. But you're probably talking about something like a prosthetic arm or a prosthetic limb. And yes, there are definitely plans to develop some better ones. Um, some of the big problems that, that they're working on, or at least that I'm aware of for prosthetics, is that um, so some of them are, you know, things that, you know, if you had a stump that, uh, you know, like, so you have an amputated leg and you put, um, you can attach the um, other part of the leg to the, um, the stump kind of like fitting it over, um, but it actually works a little bit um, more effectively if that uh, device is actually, um, part of the bone. So, you know, if there is, you know, something like, a, um, like a, a part to attach or to snap the prosthetic to, then, you know, that can, um, that can help with um, integrating and you can help uh, people uh, to use their prosthetics more effectively. As far as my research field, one thing that can definitely help is uh, ways to prevent infection uh, that are related to those prosthetics. So if it's a percutaneous device, if it is something that crosses that skin barrier, or even if it doesn't, um, so some of those um, types of materials could, uh, you know, they could cause um, injury, things like blisters, and 
then that kind of thing could um, lead to infection. Um, so, so, so we also have a question from Crescent about the things that you need or things that we need from you guys to help the program. So, um, you know, maybe I'll ask uh, whether or like what level are you? Are you a teacher or um, is this from the students or um, so, you know, for either, you know, I think from teachers, what we could use more of is just, you know, introducing some of these concepts and, um, okay, so from, uh, from teachers, you know, understanding these concepts from students, um, from a student perspective, um, we definitely need a lot of talented uh, students to do research and to help in the development of some of these materials. So, you know, we, we need people to stay in STEM and we need people to dream big and to, um, you know, not be afraid to be innovators in this field. So a lot of times in the medical device industry, it's kind of a, a weighing costs versus, uh, versus innovation. So, you know, we kind of, we, we need people at all different levels. So we need entrepreneurs, we need uh, people in business and um, all kinds of good things. I'm not sure if that completely answers the question, but hopefully it starts. Um, so, um, you know, we have a a comment from Janetta about uh, prosthetics. Um, so you said that you had um, prosthetics uh, in um, the hip or maybe in your um, the hip. bone. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, there's a lot of different materials also, but that's a, another limitation of things like hip implants. I'm not sure how long in between them but they have a finite lifetime. So, you know. Right. We I mean, well, uh, here's my take on it because initially when I first got it, I was 20. And of course they didn't want to do it because at that time I was the youngest person. I was like, I don't want to keep living like this, do it. I mean, yeah. that's their argument, it doesn't last. Well, the one that I was born with that was natural didn't last either. So, <laughs> yeah. I mean, let's be realistic. And so the first one, I think it lasted almost seven years or eight and the next one lasted seven and this one i have now i've had since 2008 so mm -hmm. it's coming up on 13 years yeah and i'm not sure if they tell you sometimes they don't really tell you you know what the specific type of material yeah, yes. I can't remember. I, they probably did, but I can't remember. Um, the first one and the third one were done here in Memphis or with Campbell Clinic. Um, and the second one, I, I had it done while I was in Cincinnati. Um, I actually have the card from the original one. So it's probably on that card because they used to give you a card because sometimes it does set off the, um, the oh, detectors yeah. at the airport. Um, but I think it's on there what it's made of that one the first one yeah well and some of them may have been made from lighter materials have you noticed a difference in uh you know kind of the the weight of you know like how it it feels like how heavy it uh, is nah <laughs> when, when you're dealing with pain you, you don't pay that any attention <laughs> yeah so you know some people have also mentioned that you know i mean it's not a, a dire side effect but a lot of the hip replacements um particularly for some metal on metal uh configurations um people would complain about them squeaking so, you know, it was like, oh, I've never experienced the squeaking, no. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, they would say, um, you know, something like, you know, I just, you know, people can hear me coming, you know, I can never sneak up on anybody anymore. But uh, yeah, so, you know, but there have also been some 
uh, some more um, alarming uh, results from uh, some types of implants that have been recalled from the market. So, you know, I think that they've stopped using um, certain configurations of certain metals because um, and particularly for something like a hip implant, if uh, some metals like leach out over time and can have you know, neurological effects or- yeah, that, um, was, uh, that was um, portrayed in um, Grey's Anatomy last season with Dr. Um, oh God, what's the black guy name? I forget his name. Richard Weber. Richard Weber, yeah. Richard Weber had a problem. He was doing all these crazy things and one of the uh, interns who was on punishment got the digging and he figured it out. It was, I think he had a titanium implant and the titanium had started affecting him and it, it had done all kinds and they showed all that. I was like, oh, that is gross. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, well, they portrayed that in uh, Grey's Anatomy last year. You know, and sometimes if you uh, watch some of the commercials, uh, like I see all these commercials about, you know, like 1-800 mesh justice. And, you know, like if you have received a hernia repair mesh. So, you know, there's a, there's a lot of um, societal context that needs to, you know, that sometimes comes into play because, you know, sometimes these implants fail and sometimes it, um, sometimes the responsibility for those failures is shifted around you know, between the, the FDA and the medical device companies. And really, I, I don't think that anybody ever intends to design a, an implant that is bad or that doesn't function. Right. But you know, that's also why we have to do so much work in the lab testing them exactly. to make sure that, um, that they are safe. All right, well, this has been a, a really good crowd, I think. Um, so lots of good um, input into the chat and lots of good questions. So. Yes, <clears throat> thank you very much to all the people that were here with us today and extra special thank you to Dr. Jennings. We greatly appreciated her sharing her time and expertise with us. So we look forward to seeing all of you at our next session in March. <laughs>